Hello, everyone. It feels that um, I screwed up. I'm sorry. Uh, I thought I was speaking to you and I was speaking to nobody, actually. So we'll start over again. All right. So we were supposed to talk about a start about five minutes ago and uh, we were talking, Isabel and I, to nobody, which is great, right? So I uh, hope uh, it is not too much of a problem. I'm very sorry about that. So uh, let me uh, again start over. And uh, well, here we go. So hoping now that everything's fine. I'm very, very sorry about that. I was certain I was speaking to you guys and Giuseppe and I were practicing basically. So <laughs> sorry again. Uh, so we'll talk about today uh, design and technical document management. Um, my name is Benoit Bilodeau and uh, with me I have uh, Giuseppe and uh, I am uh, the director of the product data management um, department, if you will, at Solid Expert. And uh, I'll let, uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I've been working for Solid Experts for the last 15 years. So if you don't know me, that's fine. Uh, I've been around for quite a while. Uh, and um, before that, I was a mechanical designer for about 12 years, working with SolidWorks and even prior to that, AutoCAD. So uh, yes, I've been uh, working quite a lot in this industry. And uh, I'll let Jezebel uh, present herself. Yes, my name is Jezebel Daou. I am solution specialist in product data management at Solid Experience since uh, four years. Uh, before that, I was working in data management for almost 15 years. So uh, my expertise, my expertise, sorry, is really in data management. And at the, at the beginning of my career, I start as an industrial designer. So I worked in SolidWorks at the beginning. Um, mostly my role here is to install and configure the product SolidWorks PDM and give the training about uh, this product. I just want to say that I am not perfectly bilingual. So sorry for all the mistakes that I will do. Uh, I hope that it will be clear enough for you, uh, my explanation. Right, thank you, Isabel. So just as you know, as you might notice, we're doing this from Montreal and uh, well, we're French speaking. So you'll hear the accent and sometimes uh, we'll be fumbling to try to find the, the perfect words. So we, we are, uh, we, we're sorry about that. So hoping it's not too much of a problem for you guys. So let's uh, introduce this. So uh, design and document management. Uh, what is it? Well, in a nutshell, it's pretty much a place where you can uh, uh, you can ensure it's a centralized control environment for uh, secret storage of your all your files or your CAD files or any other documentation that you would like to to control. And um, it helps us. It helps people using it to establish some standard ways of working, some standards with the methods, the tools that you'll need to approve documents, classify them, versioning them. Uh, distribute them, archiving them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a tool that's uh, very important that we feel is very important, and we'll be uh, discussing the different topics upcoming here uh, about CAD files management and document management as well, numbering system, change management, version management, and configurations. This uh, webinar is uh, a webinar where, where uh, we will be ready to answer any questions that you might have about document management. But obviously, we wanted to make sure we had a basic. Uh, uh, basic uh, content for this uh, webinar. So we did already prepare these topics, and at the end of each topic, will be you'll be able to, to to ask any questions you might have, and also at the end of the webinar, if you feel that we an, didn't answer properly any of the any questions you would have in mind. Okay, so just so you know, you'll have enough time to ask questions. Still, it's about an hour, so uh, hoping this won't be too long and uh, will be interesting for you guys. So who we're talking to? to everyone, basically. Everyone who's working with CAD files, everyone who's working with other documents in CAD files who needs to uh, to make sure to control them. So whether you're smart, a small or a big company, whether you're by yourself, whether you're working as a team, you know, whether you do everything in the company, we feel that it is very important to use a, uh, a document management system or software. And uh, the reasons are that you want to control, you want to protect, you want to establish standard methods, and you want to get organized and basically that's what you need in the PDM system whether it's a PDM as you would call it product data management system or any other uh, just so you know uh, since we're representing the SolidWorks line of product we'll uh, very often um, uh, 
make, show you examples in these softwares. And uh, it's important to you know that the softwares we're representing are excellent softwares for you guys to do that. But we're trying to take here a broader perspective on document management. And we wanted to make sure that it is not applied to functionalities of the software, but principles of document management. So that uh, we might not always talk about software, even if sometimes we do relate to that. Okay. All right. So today's plan is quite simple. We're going to share our expertise uh, that we've uh, accumulated with the years of practice and implementing the PDM system, basically. And um, then uh, at the end of these uh, little sections, there's going to be some uh, question period that we'll be able to, uh, to answer any questions you might have. All you have to do is in the um, go to webinar interface, just uh, click on the to raise your hand, and uh, we'll answer these questions at, during these periods. Uh, so we'll give you the microphone, and you can then just ask the questions if you have any for the benefits or other people who are assisting this webinar today. Okay, so I hope it's all good with you guys. Sorry again for the delay. Now I'll give uh, the hand to Jezabel, who will uh, talk about CAD files and, and, and technical document management uh, in general. And then that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, let's talk about the CAD files management and any other technical documents management uh, in the next slides. So first question is what does the control and security of technical documents provide? So, sorry, I have a lot of window open, okay. So if you don't have any document management software, you probably use an uncontrolled and insecure methods of storage. So it could be two kinds of method. Maybe you are in paper format, or maybe you use a digital format on a private hard drive, so your own computer, for example, or a shared hard drive on the network. Okay, into these two uh, methods, it's uh, uncontrolled and insecure compared to using a document management software. Let's say why. When you use a paper format, it is not secure, of course, because paper format is just some printed drawing that you insert into a folder and that you store into a filling cabinet. And so this is, of course, not secure. Even if you lock the drawer, your document will not resist to a fire, for example. Okay, so it's not secure because it could be uh, loose at any moment. Uh, even if you put your old revision into this filling cabinet, uh, it's really, really uh, easy to lose this information. Of course, it's a loss of space also. Uh, at the beginning, you will have maybe 100, 200, 300 documents, but eventually you will have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 documents. So you will buy another filling cabinet and another and another, and eventually uh, you will have a, a room of filling cabinet. And so it's a big loss of space. The researches will, will not be easy uh, with this uh, storage method neither because, of course, you have to search into the folder and it will not be possible to search on a specific product characteristic. So, for example, the material. So, if you want to know which part into all your uh, produ uh, products is in ABS, for example, it's not possible in a paper format to find this kind of information, not easily. For the digital format on a private or a shared hard drive, I would say that maybe it seems a little bit more secure. It's uh, not easy to lose this information. If you have a, a, a good backup plan, you will have uh, a security on this digital format files. But maybe you will have 
uh, a lack of homogeneity in names or structure. So, for example, the numbering system depends only on how your employees are disciplined. So there is no um, automatic numbering. It's all uh, just on what the people know or don't know. The same for the structure, how to be sure that the employees will respect uh, an established system. Uh, also, the teamwork is not easy uh, with this kind of uh, storage method, just because with SolidWorks, for example, when you open an assembly, even if the assembly has 100 parts in it, all the other colleagues will not be able to work on these parts as when the assembly is already open. So, so the assembly should be closed and so people can work on the parts. It's not the same into a document management software. It, you will have the possibility to one person work on the assembly and 100 other colleague, colleague can work on the 100 parts. It's possible. Uh, same thing, the research, the research is not easy. Uh, we know that searching in Windows Explorer is never uh, easy. And same thing, it's not possible to search on a specific product characteristic as a material, for example. So let's see what the, the, the control of the technical CAD documents provide with a document management software. So CAD document, we know it's computer-aided design document. So we can, with a document management software, have a control method of storage. It's, thing, uh, it's a digital format, but you will save it into a document management software, uh, probably into a vault, okay? So what gives you this storage method? First, permission and access control. So you can um, set who can do what and when. So this is for the permission and for the access, you can decide which group will have the right uh, access, the, the right rights and the read rights also. So some people can have the possibility to modify the files and some other people don't have the rights to modify a file. They are just in read only. Same thing, you will have approval processes. So you will be able to define which group can approve the document. So it's really permission and access control. Is re it's really to define what task can be done by whom and when. You will have the possibility to have a complete homogeneity in name and structure. So you can have a numbering standardization. Uh, even it could be automated. Uh, you will see some kind of example in the next slide. And you can have also an organized and controlled structure that will be defined by the administrator of your document management software. And so all the employee will work in the same way in the same software. Uh, of course, you don't have the possibility to uh, have duplicate copy. So uh, it's really easy into a document management software to, um, to uh, block the possibility to have duplicate copy. And so it avoids error and it reduces workload. You will have some easy, easy researches. Uh, I will show you in the next slide the classification and the indexing, and uh, it will allow to search with a specific product characteristic. And finally, easy teamwork, just because you can work on parts contained in the same assemblies at the same time. So even if someone is working on the assembly, someone else can work on the parts into this assembly. 
And I want to add also for the teamwork that it's possible also to give the access to the other departments, because we know that the engineering department is always uh, the principal resource for all kind of question about the product. So every day you have some question from the production department, from the purchasing department, from any other department. And so by giving access to the document management software to all the other departments, they will be able to find the information by themselves. So everybody is independent, everybody can find the information by their, themselves, and so the engineering team um, don't have uh, the, to, uh, to answer to all the questions, and so it reduces the uh, workload and uh, increase their productivity. What does the control of the other technical documents? So I, I think about the non-CAD documents here. So what can be an example of a non-CAD technical documents that we want to control? It could be the change requests. It could be any kind of forms, maybe part specification or project specification or project financial reports any kind of document like word excel powerpoint uh, maybe it could be for the graphic department it could be illustrator photoshop so any kind of other uh, other document that are not um, designed 3d and 2d cad document so it will be the same with the, the document management software you will save these documents into this software and you will have a control method of storage. So it will be again in digital format, saved into the vault, and it will give you the same advantages as for CAD file. So the control, permission and access, the homogeneity, numbering and structure, easy researches, and possibility of a collaboration. I will add also that you can have a constancy in the use of form templates because we know that when we have form templates uh, saved on a shared folder on the network, for example, all the employee will copy paste this form to their own computer to be able to use it very, very easily. And so eventually, some months later, when this form will be updated, so all the employee will have not necessarily the last updated um, version. And so they will all use a different form, even if it's the same form, it's not the same version of the form. So when you put these, these form into a document management software, all the people will go there to find the, 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 the form and so they will always use the latest version of the form. So it's why there is a constancy uh, with the using of the form. And finally, I will say that if all the employees from all the department use the same software to store their files, so it will be the same training to give to all the employees. So of course, it's similar training because the, the engineering group will need to know how to modify a document. And for example, the production group will just need to know how to read the document. But it's the same software, it's the same using and all the people can receive a similar uh, training and it's really good for this. What level of security should be applied to the technical documentation? So in the, the previous slides, I show you what is the advantage of controlling, but now we talk about the security. So it's not, totally uh, uh, the same thing. 
So I would say that you can never be careful enough. Your technical documents are the center of all the lucrative activities of your company. So without technical documents, there are no productions possible. So no productions, no products. Without productions, products, there is no sale possible. So without sales, there is there are no profits possible okay so the the technical document are really really important because it's how you make money into your company so with the document management software you can have yes a control method of storage but you can have also a secure method of storage by saving a digital format into the software it will gives you a limitation of permission and access so previously it was a control of permission and access and now it's a limitation so the administrator can decide who can see what and when into the approval processes the the I mean the files life cycle. So maybe this department will see it just when it's totally approved, totally released. So it's really, really uh, secure. You will have also a history of changes. So nobody will be able to modify a drawing in secret because somewhere into the history you will see that this document has been changed by this person at this hour at this date so there's no possibility that an illegal action can be done uh, without having something written into the history so because of that there are no data loss possible uh, of course, you need a backup plan. It's not because you have a document management software that it's magical. You have to, with your IT team, to plan a backup of all your data. But with a, a good backup plan, you will no more uh, lose any data. And uh, in addition, you preserve all, all the old revisions. So in the future, you will be able to see the old revision um, with uh, very, very easily. So your technical documents are the company's intellectual property. And so it should be your priority to protect them. What does classification or we can say indexing in document management software provide. The classification or indexing offers a formal description of the document using its metadata or its content. So the indexing is the description of the document and its content in order to facilitate its use and facilitate the researches. There is two types of indexing. First one is by metadata, and the other one is by content or keywords. So with metadata, it offers a formal description of the document using its metadata. Metadata can seem a, a, a very complex word, but it's really simple when you say that the metadata is the information related to your file. So the number, the description, the author, the date of the creation, material, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The, with a data management software, the vocabulary is standardized in order to allow the use of this metadata by the greatest number of research tools. And so with SolidWorks, if I go just for the SOLIDWORKS product, this metadata are the properties. And these properties can be mapped automatically in the data management software. So it's really, really easy to find, uh, to search something, to search a file 
with a very, very specific characteristic of the part, for example, the material. By with indexing, indexing by content, it rather targets the content of the document to facilitate the research, same thing. But here, for the creator of the document, for example, it may be a matter of listing all the terms or listing uh, the terms that appear most often. Okay, so you can search, for example, the word banana into all the vault. And so everywhere the word banana will be written into the content of the file, the, 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 the search result will give you the, 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 the information. So what is the, 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 the advantage of this? Is of course easy and very, very efficient researches. And since we waste a lot of time by searching something with efficient researches, you save time and of course you increase your productivity. Are all the document management software integrated into design software? No, unfortunately, not all technical document management software are linked with 3D modeling software. So I want to show you here just the difference uh, between if you have the integration with the design software and if you don't have the integration with the design software. So when you don't have the, this integration, you have to copy paste the information. So all the, the, the properties that I mentioned just before, number, description, material, author, blah, 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 you have to fill in into your design software and then copy paste this information into the other software, for example, the document management software. Okay, so of course there is a risk of error here to copy the information like that. It will duplicate the work because you have to do it twice, so you will waste a, a lot of time. And you have to log into several software to access to all the information. So you have to connect to the 3D design software and you have to connect to the document management software and so do some kind of search into one and search into the other to be able to have all the information. So it will, uh, of course, gives you some more laborious use and researches. With the integration with the design software, all this information, as I said, for example, the properties are automatically imported into the document management software. So it, it avoids error because you don't have to copy things. Uh, there is no duplication of work, of course, so you save some time. And uh, into some um, document management software, you have sometimes an integrated software add-in. And this is the case for our SOLIDWORKS PDM. So you have an add-in into SOLIDWORKS so you can access to the information directly from the 3D uh, design software instead of navigate into two different software. Because of all of this, it will reduce the workload of the design engineering team and so increase again your productivity. You have some question about CAD, man CAD file management or other, CAD, other uh, technical um, document. So now is the time to ask any questions about the previous topic, or if you feel that we didn't cover everything on that topic, don't be shy, just raise your hand in the uh, go to webinar interface. If not, we'll just go through with the next uh, section. Okay. Seems we're doing well. So uh, I'll take the hand again. All right. So now let me uh, talk about uh, numbering systems. So all 
I think you must know um, that we face all kinds of numbering systems when we go to uh, any customers to implement PDM or any uh, want to discuss uh, the numbering system. And what we do see is there's always a clash between people using a significant significant file numbering system versus a non-significant file numbering system. So for instance, here, let's say we compare a document like MC-2370-10-45 or another one that's simply called 2045503. You know? So what's the difference? Well, you can already kind of guess that the one that starts with MC seems to have some particular ways of being, um, you know, bit, with, with these dashes that it shows that there's something here that we can maybe decode where the other one, there's no way, well, there's always a way, but it doesn't look like it's easy to decode. So for instance, let, let's look at your significant uh, number uh, example. So for, you see here, it starts with MC, with uh, a 2370-10.45, and you see here that MC is a type, let's say project number for the four other digits, system for the two other one, and the sequential number from zero, uh, zero, zero to nine, nine, uh, to be able to have a couple of them. So if we look at this, the way it should be, uh, let's say looked at, let's say that the file is a, a U bracket like this one. So the type is mechanical. It was designed for project 2370, uh, the system was um, the system was uh, 10 for the system transmission, and the sequential number was 45 in that case, right? So it is just like an assumption on my part. I mean, uh, we figure out that this number could be that, or we decided as a company that this is the way we would code the numbers. So it could be useful. Uh, we know that a lot of people, where we go to look at our customers, people in the floor, the people in the shops love it because they look at the file and to them it means something it it means that it goes somewhere for in particular but you could always ask yourself because it was always the way it was done that's what we've been told as well it was always done that way but we have to keep in mind that this was done in an era where there was no or very few document control system besides a manual one with uh, you know putting down somewhere by writing in a big book so this makes sense to create a significant uh, file numbering system because if you don't have all the documents or the, all the, the the power of a document management software, well, it becomes kind of necessary, right? So we could argue about that. So let's look, for instance, again at the same part and another one that's identical, but the name is different because this one is used for uh, electrical harnessing support in another project, in another subsystem with another sequential number. So it could happen that you have very similar parts or even identical parts bearing two different numbers. And that becomes like two part numbers for the same part, basically. So if you're maintaining an inventory, it means that you'll figure out, oh, we don't have no more MC 2370-1045, and you'll order more of them where, in the same time, you do have in stock 20 EL 2430 22 which could you know, be easily used to replace the one that you're missing. So you're maintaining an inventory with identical parts bearing different part number. And we see that a lot. I mean, it's not something I'm, I'm inventing right now, I'm making up. It is something that we see at our customer premises that this happens. So figure, let's give it a name. A number that's sequential that has so no signification. It means that at this point, this parts could this part could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be in a specific project. It doesn't have to be in a specific subsystem. It could be anywhere. It doesn't have to be even electrical, mechanical, pneumatic, hydraulic. We don't care. This part could be used in many ways anywhere. And this way, uh, if you're using PDM, you'll have a data card. And the data card being all kinds of metadata organized to be visible and easy, easily readable by human beings like you and I. And here you got the serial the, the document number is here. Uh, you got the description of what it is, the material, whatever paint or finish you want to put in. All the information is readily available in PDM. So whether you do, you know when you use a document a documentation control system, this gives you this power. So you don't need to know 
by looking at the number of where it goes. And quite frankly, in the, in, in the shop or uh, people, if they have assembly drawings with bombs and, and, and balloons, there should be no reason actually to know what the number means because you're going to look at your assembly drawing and notice that balloon number four is relating to 2045503, which you can find anywhere. And if you need more information about it, if you're in PDM again and you click on that file, you'll notice that you, if you have the, the where used, the where used tab here that tells you where it is used. So if you really want to know where this part is being used and if it's used in multiple assemblies, you'll see that right away on that screen. So it, it is even faster and better than trying to figure out with this with the serial number, what is the name, sorry, the file part number, what it means again. And it is very easy, easily searchable because as just as I mentioned, we can search by metadata. So all the properties in SOLIDWORKS will be copied into the data card. And here you can just click, you know, search for a U bracket. And here we go. We find on this one, we follow. And so if you need a bracket for in the design, you're in the, de you're in the design stage right now. You know you've been using the bracket similar to this one in previous assemblies because you remember that. But you don't know the exact same, the exact number of it. Well, you just do a search and then you can reuse parts that are already existing instead of redesigning everything again and again and again and over again, thinking it's going to be faster because very often I've heard that, oh, it's much faster to redesign it in SolidWorks and looking for it. Well, yes, if you don't have a document management system, I can understand that. But, but once you're using PDM or uh, and any other document management system, you should be able to easily find a part by clicking a description, by searching for a description in the search tool provided with the document management system. So in a nutshell, yeah, we prefer sequential numbers without signific signification. This way you can generate automatically some numbers, you know, for numbering the parts, you don't care anymore. You click on save in SOLIDWORKS, it grabs the next number, no, no question asked. It avoids duplicates if we can at least it promotes, you know, it does promote reusing existing parts. So if you really uh, take advantage of this uh, of this feature of reusing the same parts over and over again, it will avoid duplicates. And it's very useful as well for con continuous improvement on your parts. You know, if you, you've got this part and you want to improve it for some reason, maybe make it lighter, but you know, this will be, uh, this will be used by all other assemblies uh, that are using this parts already, as long as you respect some little uh, basics that we'll talk about a bit later on uh, about it. So this, you know, to make sure that this is going to work well. But yes, you'll save some, uh, you'll save some money, you'll save some time. And if you can promote, so if it can only promote be using existing parts that you have already designed, why design it again? It's already there. You already have a price probably for from a from a supplier. And if you uh, use this parts uh, broad in the broader perspective or in all the machine in everywhere, uh, this way you'll save uh, you'll save cost as well. You can order more, and the more you order, maybe the unit parts will be uh, less, the, the, the unit price will be reduced. Sorry about that. All right, so this was for this general this little topic of numbering systems. Uh, if you have any questions on that, or maybe. The, the questions in the Jezebel's uh, section that she, she, she's, she's shown before that could have come up to mind. And just don't be shy. Guy, sorry. Ask your question away. Or, uh, just raise your hand. All right. I guess we're doing well, Jezebel. So I will uh, then uh, give you the hand. All right. Okay, so the next slide slides will be about the change management. So change management is an important, um, it's really important in document management uh, software also. So let's go with the first question. Why should a controlled change request process be implemented? So why it should be control this is the question we know that any change has impacts so it could be an impact on your human resources it could be some financial impacts and maybe 
any kind of various minor or major impacts. So it's really, really important to frame the change process so that these impacts are analyzed before initiating the change. So when you have a controlled change request process, it will allow to first evaluate the effort. So it could be the effort, uh, the effort in time and the effort also in human resources. Uh, you will have also to evaluate the cost. Also, you will have to assess the relevance. We know that the change can come from any place, maybe any department. So it could be from the production department, it could be from the, the customers itself, or it could be from your boss, for example. So you have to evaluate the change, you have to evaluate the request to be sure that it's really relevant. You don't want to change something just because it's a nice to have. It should be really relevant to do, uh, to, to, to put some effort on it and to put maybe some money on it, okay? And finally, you have to evaluate the impacts on your inventory, the current inventory and also on the current and the future productions and of course at the end on the customers because they will um, notice the the change and so it's important to evaluate the impact of them on them also so after this evaluation if the change request is approved the modification of the files can start so what is a change request process? Maybe at your company, you don't call your uh, change request like that. Uh, I, I said here, engineering change request, ECR, engineering change order, ECO, and followed by the engineering change notice, uh, which is the notification of the change. Uh, maybe you put you you just call it EC for engineering change. Maybe it's a change request. Maybe a modification request. So all the terms into your company can be different, but at the end the process is the same for all the company. So first you have of course the correction re request. So this is the ECR. This is the the. Um, the proposal of the items to be modified. And now after the request has been sent or has been received, we are awaiting the approval. And so it will have a decision that needs to be made. So someone into the, the design group or the engineering group will need to make a decision. It could be someone, just one person, or it could be a committee that will uh, evaluate all the, the things that I just mentioned before, the cost, the impact, blah, 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 and then decide if we want to go with this modification or we don't want. If we don't want to go, the request will be cancelled. And it could be for multiple reasons. For example, maybe it's too expensive. Maybe we don't have the time to do it right now. And so it could be canceled for now, but eventually, eventually we will do the change, but not, not now. Uh, maybe we think that after the evaluation that it will reduce the quality and we don't want to go there. there. So maybe to save some costs, we can have a, a, a change request, but if saving money will cause to uh, reduce the quality too much and so the product will uh, break at any moment it's not it's not good so this is the job of the uh, design uh, responsible or engineering uh, committee to decide if it's relevant to do this modification and, and if it's a not acceptable solution so we will just don't go there 
in in uh, in opposite if the change request is approved so we will go to the eco this is the engine change order so it's where the items will be confirmed so maybe it's at the beginning this item and this item and this item uh, should be um, modified but when the engineering group look at it they see that it's not just these items but this one this one then this one and this assembly and this assembly and this assembly so into the eco it's where the items to be modified will be confirmed and the full description of the modification will be sent to uh, the, the the person that should make the modification so the modification will be in progress and eventually when the modification will be done uh, the modification will be uh, sent to a notification to all the people that need to know all the departments that needs to know that there is a modification and uh, it's probably some kind of new revision release new parts release maybe new assembly um, new revised assembly released and so it will be published and so the modification will be made and completed and uh, now we will talk about the nc part so what a true uh, uh, um, a change management uh, system you can have some non c uh, non compliant part depending of the type this non compliance may or may not initiate a change request so if it's not compliant because the manufactured part is different from the drawing so in this situation it will not initiate a change request why because the, the problem is not into the drawing the problem is into maybe the production method that don't respect what is into the drawing so this is the production team that will have to correct the error because it's their error. But if it's not compliant because the manufacturer part is the same as the drawing, but it does not work or does not fit well into the assembly. So this type of NC will initiate a change request. And then the design or engineering team will need to analyze the problem and decide which files will need to be modified to correct the error. Um, we will talk about now the FFF change rule. So FFF, it's for fit, form, and function. Fit form and function are some characteristics of a part or an assembly. The FFF rules into um, a, 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 a document management control system will allow the part and the assembly modification with a minimal documentation and a minimal design cost. But of course, this is as long as the FFF, fit, form, and function of the product is maintained. So there is two rules for the FFF. A file will be revised, so the revision will be incremented, if and only if the revised part is backward compatible. So the, the, the old part, the new part will um, work into all production current production and future production this is what backward compatible mean so of course there there was no major change to fit form and function into this situation um, in opposite if the fit form and function change to a point where the part is no longer backward compatible you will need to save your file on a new number so the old number will be uh, obsolete or put inactive and so it will be 
replaced by a new number. So all the assembly will need to be uh, changed to change this inactive part for the new active part with this new number. So this is what is the FFF change rule involved. What should we find into production instruction? So production information or any kind of orders information should never ap uh, appear into technical drawings. Only the manufacturing information should be there. So for example, the dimension, of course, it should be there because it's to build the, the parts, so it's needed. But any information related to the production should not be there. For example, the quantity to be produced must not appear into the drawings. So the quantity will be into the bomb. So if you need three parts of this kind into the assembly, the bomb will show this part in quantity of three, but you don't have to put it into your drawings. And neither uh, it, the, related to the orders. So the PO number with the, the, the quantity, for example, 3000 to, to produce should not be into technical drawings. Also, the information related to the, the inventory, for example, if uh, you uh, increase a revision uh, uh, on a document, must not appear into the drawings neither. It will be important, however, to communicate this instruction related to the current inventory uh, in, uh, in a way uh, to the other department. So it could be via a form or it could be via the, uh, another um, inventory uh, management system like ERP or MRP. And so you will have to say what to do with the inventory. So do you want to use the, the parts in inventory to rework the parts in inventory or just to put it in the garbage and so scrap? Do you have any question about the change management? No, so I will give now the, the revision management subject to Benoit. There we go, all right. Um, okay, so let's talk about revision management. Knowing and uh, taking into account what's the, what Isabel just said about the three F rules, right? The fit from function rules. I just wanted to add something about the fact that sometimes you might need to create a new, a new part, right? For your actual design. It doesn't mean that the existing part has to necessarily go into uh, a, um, a an obsolete mode. Maybe you'll still keeping the old parts for previous assemblies, and when you find out that you can't use that part and the actual assembly you're working on, you might need to create a new part, but keep the other one alive, you know, for uh, previous ones. Uh, where when you modify a part uh, and make a new revision, it will impact all the previous assemblies in which you use where. This is why the 3F rules is very important. And talking about 3F rules, uh, what happens with, uh, how do we manage these revisions in, uh, on a daily basis with the system uh, like, uh, like PDM or any other, uh, any other document management uh, software or system? So first of all, when you look at the BOM, right? Revision management and BOMs. Uh, if you look in the system by itself, there are two ways to visualize BOMs most of the time. Uh, an assembly and their, and their parts, you know. So there's uh, the as built. So if you look at it as built, it means that when you checked in in PDM or any other system, you checked in your assembly, it remembers what were the revisions of the parts that are in this assembly, right? So it remembers it, meaning that you can find this information. But you can also work with a mode that's called latest, where you don't really care. Because since uh, since the last maybe two months, maybe uh, it was the last time you checked in the assembly, some of the parts might have been improved with time, respecting the three Fs, obviously, to make sure it's backward compatible. And it'd be good for you to use these latest parts on your assembly. So 
just to picture this, if you look in PDM and you look at the bottom, you'll notice you can look at it as built, meaning that when we check this revision, this version A, revision A, sorry, of this assembly, uh, all these parts were their respective revisions, with this exception being at B, the end cover was at B, everything was at A. That was when we checked in revision A of that assembly. But if you look at it today, as in the latest mode, the same assembly now, some of the files have been like modified and improved with time, respecting the three Fs. So it is backward compatible. So you don't really want to care about it. What you want to do is just to use the latest ones, especially if proper instructions were sent to the uh, to, to, to the, the shop to make sure that the inventory was properly cured, you know, whether it was uh, it was uh, to, to scrap, to rework, or to deploy, uh, deplete whatever uh, is in stock. So what you want to do as, as an engineer, as a designer, is to always work with the latest revisions of these parts. And it's possible to do it in a system like this, which brings us here. So we show parts revision on the bottom that's visible on the, on, the, on, the, on the drawings of an assembly, right? So do we show these revisions? And yet, if yes, why? If no, why not, right? So let's just illustrate this with that. This is a sub-assembly of, of a flashlight, and you'll notice that when it was checked in at revision A, all the parts were at revision A. So if in the bomb I decide to show the revision, it might look smart, right? Because you know exactly what revision were the parts when you did that. Now, let's say we add, we want to, we just want to add a little fillet here because we we find that it is the sharp edge is, is dangerous to, to hurt ourselves or whatever too. So meaning that in the previous here, um, sorry, I just want to go back here. This, this little edge is too sharp and we really want to make it smoother. So we decide to add a fillet right here. So which means that now the part has changed, but it is respecting the three Fs. It is the same form, the same fit, the same function of the part. It is backward compatible. It doesn't matter if you use a previous version of this or this one. It will fit. It will work. It will be okay. But now that we show the revisions in the bomb, it shows here revision B. Now we need to change this revision because the drawing is different. You understand? Something has changed in the drawing that's really visible. Not only that, that we don't really care about the fact, the detail here that we see are affiliate or not. It is not important. And the big scheme of things where you want to know where it goes what what goes where but this information now has changed and some people to whom you might send the drawing will say well this is not a revision a anymore so you need to upgrade this one to b as well understand so now you've done this for this assembly because you changed a minor detail on the part now imagine now the flashlight itself which uses this set assembly here now has got a b one but this one is at A as well. Now this information as you need to be updated, you'll need to update this one at B too. And imagine that you have subsystems in which you're using the other systems on top and go you know, further up of the pyramid. Maybe at the end, you'll need to change the main assembly of whatever you're doing to a new revision. Now, if you change another part in another subsystem, you'll do it again and again and again. So every time you'll want to improve a part, in your assemblies, you'll need to go up and climb the stairs and change it where the main assembly will be at revision W very, very, very fast. And there's no value added to do that because if you work with the latest view of your bomb, always using the latest revisions because you respect the three F rules, well, why do that? So we, we feel that it's not a good idea to put revisions in the bomb in the, in the drawing, because if the recipe doesn't change, if the quantities are the same, if the balloons are the same number, it, there's no reason. You, you can always work it out because you use the latest versions or revisions of your parts. You should be able to rely on that. So here, for instance, if you don't put the revision number in your bomb, it doesn't matter if this part has changed. You take the latest one. As long as the recipe is, well, we got these four parts, the quantities are good, we just want to assemble them, and these five parts, sorry. And you would, so this keeps it, this keeps it at A. And further up, the, up the, the, the pyramid here, 
Well, this one doesn't change as well because the subassembly by itself, you need one. You don't care how it's done. Even if, by the way, even if I was going to go back, you know, here, for instance, and if this one as a, a part would change to B, let's say what we decide to add another lens or uh, to add another little uh, options on, on this head, and this head now has six parts, the recipe changes here, and it goes from A to B. We don't care because this head here would still fit because you apply the three the, the three F rules to subassembly as well. They become like a part. So this doesn't matter because if let's say this part is a bit different, but it still fits in the flashlight here, we don't care even if this one is A or B or C, as long as a unit, it works with it. So it is a lot easier to manage your revisions and to keep control of your revisions if you don't put the revisions column right here in the bomb. This is what we think. So I don't know if you guys have any questions on that topic or not. So I'm just uh, willing to listen to you or if you uh, raise your hand if you have any questions about that. I hope it makes sense, right? Okay. So I see here that no questions have been asked. I guess we're doing well again. So I'll just uh, go on with the next slide and uh, go into the configurations and give the hand to Jezebel. Okay, so since the time is flying, I will go uh, a little bit faster on this subject since uh, it's really related to SOLIDWORKS. Of course, there is configuration into other kind of 3D software, but the, the way it's done into SOLIDWORKS is really specific to SOLIDWORKS. So when you create configuration into SOLIDWORKS, it's one file with a lot of part into the same file. So what I want to um, explain now is in which situation it is recommended to use the configuration and in which situation it is not recommended to use the configuration. So first thing first, let's uh, look at the configuration types. So for example, you can have parts or assembly family and so it's with minor difference. Minor difference means, for example, you have this part in, in this length, and maybe you have this one a little bit longer, and this one a little bit longer. So it's a good way to create these parts with configuration since, it, since it's a very minor difference. So it could be the length, it could be a difference in the material, a difference in color. So as, as long as this is a minor difference, it's good. Same thing for an assembly family. So you can have, for example, this barbecue with the top cover closed, with the door open, and for example, an exploded view. So again, this is really minor difference between all of these configuration and it could be used for instruction manual for example of any kind of rendering images that you have to do you can also use the the configuration for a machine part so let's say you have a blank part like that and you want to use it for three different uh in three different uh, assembly and so you will modify after with maybe one hole one hole in the middle and maybe two hole for different use okay so mesh and part is a good way also to use the configuration I will not recommend to use the configuration for part or assembly configurator so I mean with major difference. So for example, you have this part and then you create this one and this one and this one and this one all into configuration. But at the end, the configuration one has nothing to do with the configuration five. And so this is not a good way to use the configuration. Even if this part is assembled on the same shaft, the, 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 the difference between all these parts 
uh, is very too big and so you cannot use the configuration for that. In addition, when you use the data management software, is it recommended to use the configuration? So I will say if you can avoid the use of configuration and have for each part an assembly its own file, that's better. Okay, let me explain why. In the data management software, each time a configuration is added to the 3D file, automatically the revision of the 3D file will be incremented. And also all the associated drawings will also have a revision incrementation. So what, we, we, what it means is that your production team or your suppliers will receive a new drawing with a new uh, revision on it, but without any modification. So it's, it, it will be very important if you want to use configuration into data management software to inform your production team or your suppliers that your documents may change revision without any modification having taken place. So it could cause some confusion. There is a possible alternative to um, fix or to solve this uh, problem. Uh, so you can use a different revision scheme, uh, schema for the 3D parts, for example, uh, revision numeric. And for the 2D drawings, you can use a revision alphabetical, for example. So when you will create a new configuration into your 3D part, the numeric revision will be increased. But the 2D drawing, since it's not the same revision schema, will uh, stay at the same uh, revision and only the new configuration will have a new drawing. And so only this new drawing will be sent to uh, the production team or the suppliers. The problem with that is that there is no link with, uh, between the 3D parts revision and 2D drawings revision. And so this practice will require extremely methodical management to avoid errors and misunderstanding. And I'm, I'm not sure that the time that you will save by using the configuration, you will uh, win uh, with this possible alternative. I am not sure that you will win some, something because you will have to be very, very, very precise into your uh, revision management. What are, so what are the best practices for using configuration? So if um, you still want to use the, the configuration, I will give you two recommendation. So if possible, always create a separated drawing for each configuration. So even if there is 25 configuration into your part, uh, 3D part file, please create a separated drawing for each configuration. It will be very, very easier to manage. And second point, if the master part of your configuration must be modified. So the first one, if you modify this one and this will affect all the other uh, configuration, it's really, really important to validate the compatibility of this new revision for each configuration one by one into each assembly where this, this and this and this configuration it's used. Okay, so this is something that using configuration, sometimes it's not well done. So you change a configuration without giving import, importance of uh, validating the compatibility. And so all the, the configuration change at the same time. And eventually when they produce something with the uh, 25th configuration, 
there is a problem, the, the, the fit is no more good into the assembly, and so you will have to do a, a change backward or another parts or something like that. So for, on my, from my point of view, the use of one file per part force this validation because you will have to open each part, change each part, and so change also the assembly related to this part. And so check if it's good, uh, it's still good, and it's if the, 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 the fit into the assembly is still good. Okay. Question about configuration? So again, it brings everything back to the 3F rules, right? So the configurations will make it much harder for you guys to respect the 3F rules because it makes you work a lot more. So again, as Giuseppe was saying, you save time in design, but you lose time in managing the files. So you have to figure out which one is more important for you. Okay, so I don't see any questions again. Um, so we'll conclude at this point. I'll just take the... All right. So um, what we see here is dot management will help you to avoid errors and mistakes, avoid you wasted time and money, it will increase efficiency and productivity. But again, it can be demanding for the design engineering team to use that. So what we're here for here is to help you. We're here to help you use these softwares and these systems. So again, we are um, we are selling you know, SolarWorks PDM well, standard, which is include the Uyghur professional or premium licenses of SolarWorks or SolarWorks PDM professional, which if you use will include PDM experts tools, a little set of tools that we've designed to help you go even further with SolarWorks PDM professional that is available to do a you free of charge as long as you're uh, using our, um, our tech support um, maintenance, uh, annual maintenance, right? Uh, and we offer as well as document management consultation service. So the idea here is to, the idea here is to, to, um, to offer you our services that is, that are not only installing the software, but also, as you've seen, we've got some experience and some insight of how to use document management systems. And we'd like to, to you know, to, uh, to help you. If you're wondering what to do with it, how to do it, and uh, we can help you implementing it and give you giving you some type of advice of, on how to use it and maybe transform the way you're working depending on of how far you'd like to go. So we're we're ready to give you some some uh, consultation with that and we'd glad we'd be glad to do it. So uh, a little note here that PDM is compatible with other SolidWorks CAD files, right? Like AutoCAD, Inventor, Solid Edge, Pro E files, with you know some limitations sometimes, but if you feel that you have a lot of files that you'd like to move into the SolidWorks environment, uh, that'd be fine. We can do it, help you and do it for you. Uh, so as a conclusion, you know, there's no one only one only uh, real way of working with document te technical management and how to document and manage them. There are many ways to do it. We feel that we've give, give, given you some advice on, on how uh, we see things and uh, to help you maybe start on the right foot because if you go in the wrong direction, it's a lot harder to come back. And hoping that our expertise and experience will be helpful to you in the future. Hoping to see you again. So thank you for uh, for uh, being there, for uh, coping with us. And uh, I know it's been a bit further, a bit longer than we thought. So um, if you got any other questions, uh, we're still available now. If not, we'll just end this presentation. And uh, yeah, that'll be it. So uh, I don't see any questions here. So. Thank you so much again. Have a great uh, rest of the day. Goodbye. Bye-bye.